Amen. We continue to worship this morning through the reading and preaching and hearing of God's Word. I want to invite you to open your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark as we continue to walk through Mark's account of Jesus' ministry. You'll remember that the Gospels are passion narratives with extended introductions. The whole message of each gospel is the final work of Christ's atoning at Calvary for me and for you, for those who would believe. But in that message, the gospel writers give a lot of backstory. And so that's where we are. We're in Mark chapter 6. We're reading and learning about uh, Christ through his ministry. And Mark has a particular focus on the miracles that he performs And we'll see a very familiar one this morning. One of the difficulties of reading a familiar passage like the feeding of the multitude from Mark's gospel this morning for me is the desire that I have to say something that maybe you've never heard before, which is a very dangerous desire. Um, You've heard this story before. And so we'll look together at it from my perspective, with great humility, simply to marvel at the one who does the work and not at, at what I say or how do I describe it. This story is about Christ and his power in all things, at all times, in all places, and how he sovereignly sets up his disciples to do his work and to expose his power even when they don't expect him to do so. So, With that brief introduction, let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to help us as we turn now to his word. God in heaven, we do come humbly to sit at the feet of our Lord Jesus. We want to follow Mary's example and just hear from him. So Lord Jesus, we pray that you would come and shepherd your flock and Guide us, teach us, and grow us. Guard us by your word and keep us close to yourself. We thank you for the way that you use your word to minister to your people. We know that you both can and will do that in the minutes ahead. But we also pray for those in need among our congregation a difficult week of loss and pain. Many here are experiencing grief and bereavement and are close to those who are. And so we pray that you would comfort the Bauer family, comfort the Hyatt family, that you would remind us of how fragile life is and how brief things are exist upon the earth. Our lives are but a vapor, James writes. We appear for a little while and then we vanish. So help us to keep an eternal perspective together, not just this morning, but in wisdom and life and be with those who are suffering and loss. We pray for those who are suffering in other ways, who come burdened this morning. Lord, you know them. The number of hairs on their head is not a mystery to you. The psalmist writes, you, you know our, go- our going out and our coming in today and forever. And so I pray that you would come and minister to the hurt that's here in this in this very room and do it by exalting the glory and the majesty and the person of Jesus Christ may we marvel again at him his capabilities his care his compassion Lord Jesus we thank you for all these things and we pray that you would lead us for your glory for our good In Christ's name, amen. 
Mark chapter 6, beginning in verse 30. This is the word of the Lord. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Jesus feeds the multitudes. Point number one in your outline is the crowds. We see here in verse 44 at the very end of the passage, there was a, there was a pile of folks. So I just want to review how they got to where he was and give a little background and context of Mark chapter 6. So there was 5,000 men, Mark writes, which means that's how they counted. And they didn't count the women and the children simply to give an accurate number, assuming that somewhere in the range of ten to 15,000 people were among 5,000 men. That's a safe guesstimate. So this was a crowd of a significant amount of people, particularly in the days where there wasn't amplification and there wasn't uh, all the modern technologies that we enjoy. They didn't have you know, view-from-home technology. There weren't any couches out in this desolate place. It was uncomfortable. It took them a long time to get there. It was harsh. But they did it because they had a need. But the disciples also had a need. Jesus identifies that. He had sent them out. If you're familiar with Mark chapter 6, but you haven't been keeping up with our study here on Sunday mornings, Jesus had recently sent out the disciples two by two, and he had given them strict instructions on how they were to minister and where they were to go and what they were to carry and what they were to leave behind. And now they've come back. And on their return, Jesus recognizes, hey, they need some rest. So those who were closest to Jesus have come back from a mission trip of sorts. And if you've ever been on a short-term mission trip, you know that when you get back, you're pretty exhausted. And they were. 
And so Jesus leads them to a place where perhaps they can get some rest. In verse 31, we see, for many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. Have you ever been so busy that you, you didn't have time to eat? Maybe you get home and you're talking to your spouse. And you're like, well, what did you have for lunch today? And you think back and you can't even remember. You're like, you know what? I don't, I'm not sure I ate lunch today. I don't think I did. Well, that was the day that the disciples were having. Many days stacked on top of that. And they had just gotten back from this trip. They were worn out both spiritually and physically. And Jesus says, well, let's, let's, let's go. He doesn't say exactly where. Mark doesn't give us these kinds of details. This desolate place. I mean, they lived in the desert almost already. But they, they get to a place that was uninhabited. And yet, we see that the crowds were looking for Jesus. They saw them and recognized them. Which is significant, even though it's a minor point. Jesus' followers and his ministry were becoming recognizable. It was becoming obvious to people where Jesus was because they started to understand who he was. And they wanted to be near him because they had needs like you and I do. And so the crowds were aware, the crowds were following, the crowds were, well, needy. Look at verse 34. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd. And now remember, the purpose, at least what we thought, was to get away. But they couldn't get away. And our tendency would be to see the crowds and be like, y'all, look. Show's closed for now. We're busy. We're tired. We're, we need some rest. But Jesus is, is quite different. He saw the great crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Now, I don't know a lot about sheep. Praise God. But I have read some things about sheep and their needs and how ignorant they are, even though that's how God's people are described again and again and again in Scripture, sheep aren't the most intelligent animals on the farm, which is why they need a shepherd to constantly watch them. One, because they're helpless, they're in danger from predators, but two, because they wander off they go away by themselves, which makes them even more dangerous. Which is why I stress in our inquirer's class how important it is for our people to be a member of a local and particular church. How that's true for all of us here. And that when we're not, we're, we're ripe for the pickings. We're, we're sheep, perhaps, if indeed you are born again and you know Christ as Savior and Lord. And so it's interesting that Mark is drawing again this picture of the people who were seeking Jesus. They're, they're like sheep. Sheep are also in danger not just because of predators, not just because they wander off, but because they don't even know what to eat. Psalm 23, very familiar psalm about Christ himself being our shepherd. The shepherd that leads us in green pastures. Places where it's safe for us to eat. Because sheep need to be led to good food. And if they aren't, then they'll eat all kinds of poisonous things, harmful things. Things that will make them sick or even kill them. Things they can't digest. Away from water sources toward where they think they might find better food. All kinds of things. Sheep think they know, and they don't. And so Jesus is the good shepherd. He sees their need. 
And notice what he does. He doesn't start to snap his fingers and, and arrange food right away, even though that's what the main thrust of this miracle and story is about. He doesn't start to figure out who needs coats and who needs shoes and who needs school and, you know, who needs to learn how to read. Although those things are important and Christians should be involved in those types of philanthropic efforts. The first thing Jesus does when he sees that they need help is he begins to teach them many things. And this is a time when a pastor like me wishes Mark had been more descriptive. What did he teach them? What is it that Jesus knew these sheep needed to understand and learn? If, if, if his first move was to start explaining, what was it? Well, if he's like here as he is elsewhere in the account of the gospel writers, he's saying things like, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's repeating the need for a turning away from sin and a clinging to him as Lord and Master. He's claiming that he and the Father are one and he's explaining how God is actually good and he does good. He is their heavenly Father. He's their righteous judge. And he wants the very best for them. And little by little, he's developing trust in his audience so, so that he can expose their need for change, their need for repentance, their need for growth. Because those aren't easy things for us to hear. Hey, don't go eat over there. It's bad for you. Well, how do you know? That tends to be the American mentality, I'm a rugged individual. I don't need you to explain these basic things to me. I think I can take care of myself. Okay, well, great. Tell me about your marriage. Oh, well, my, my marriage is not so hot. Okay, well, have you ever considered maybe you need to listen a little bit? Tell me about your parenting. Well, our parenting's... Uh, it's good in some cases. Others are a little bit more difficult. Well, maybe you need to listen some. Maybe there are some things you need to learn. Maybe you don't have all of life figured out, and you need to know that. So I think Jesus here, in his teaching of these crowds, is to expose their need of which is what we all need. You and I, this morning, we need to see that, that we need Christ and him alone and nothing else. And you need to be convinced of that, that, that whatever it is that occupies the majority of your thoughts, whether it's how to save your money or how to make more of it or how to excel on the sports field or, or what tournaments you need to be in or what AAU teams you need to join, or how you need to coach your children up so that they can, so that they can be what? A Christ follower. I mean, is that not what our ultimate goal for our children is? And so in all these things, we get, we get peeled back. The layers of our lives and our thoughts get exposed before the one who is the source of all things. I think that's what Jesus is teaching. So it doesn't matter if our children grow up to be PhDs or not, or they grow up to be doctors or lawyers or Indian chiefs. If, if they're absent Christ, where will they go when they get exposed? I'll tell you where. They'll go to the world. They'll go to self-medication. They'll go to drugs and sexual immorality and they'll get there through 
doorway drugs like alcohol and marijuana that don't feel real bad at first. Next thing you know, they're 50 years old and in and out of rehab and you don't know what to do. So I think Jesus is exposing every single person's need in this teaching. And so, this morning, what is your need? What is he exposing to you in Mark 6 that you need? And where do you think? Where, where can that need be met? The crowds, the need. Verse 35. And when it grew late, they'd already skipped lunch again. It was late. His disciples come to him and and they say, hey, uh, Jesus, this is a desolate place. It's late in the day. Probably a good time to send everybody away and tell them to go get something to eat. Find food somewhere. Every man for himself. Which is... It's really ironic that the disciples think they need to explain these kinds of things to Jesus. It just shows how short-sighted they are. They've seen him still water and raise the dead, but he probably needs help with lunch. <laughs> and he says, you give them something to eat. So there, there's, there's spiritual need, but also there's real and practical need. And I just beat up the disciples for a minute, but it's good that they're assessing the need. I mean, they're paying attention. They're thinking logistically, practically. They're, they're back in the back counting numbers and heads and trying to figure out what are we going to do. Maybe they've seen this story play out before, and they're thinking, oh, What are we going to do with all this? I mean, they've done some calculations. They know that it's going to take 200 denarii. And that's their response almost sarcastically. Jesus, it's going to take the equivalency of like $25,000 worth of food to feed these people this one meal. Where are we going to get that? And so the need is, practically speaking, way beyond their own sufficiency. All right, don't miss that. Because in this room, there are those who have great need, and that's really all of us, but, but there's some that have a really pressing need this morning. And so I want you to see Jesus able to meet you in your need. And then there's others of us who, who are a little bit further down the road of dealing with initial spiritual need and And we are walking in step with the Spirit and we're close to Christ. And and we want to be part of that team that Christ is sending out to the crowds to meet the need. We want to be part of that team that is assessing and thinking about shepherding and thinking, thinking about practical and real needs within the congregation. And... And you need to feel this if that's you. Particularly if you're an elder or a deacon this morning. You are not sufficient... Your planning, your vacuums, your blowers, your chainsaws, all the experience you have with bookkeeping and financial consulting, you are not sufficient. Neither am I. And we can, like the disciples here do, we can get caught up in our own sufficiency and think, well, it's just not practical. It won't work. We can't do it because of that. Can you imagine how God thinks of some of our prayers? How short-sighted they are and how little faith we have. And so Jesus says, we'll go look at the balance sheet. 
how many loaves do you have? They said, we've done that. We got five. (laughs) That's the need. We got five and we've got 15,000 people. Oh, we got two fish too. And so, in real time and space, in, in today's terms, like, there is no way to meet this need. There's no way that this can possibly happen. And so, I need you to see that there's a miracle taking place here that we are called to either believe or not believe. You have that choice this morning. You have that choice this morning to believe that Jesus is actually the Son of God who condescended and lived as a human being upon the earth, born of a virgin, or not. You can choose not to believe that. But there's no way that we can interact with the Jesus of Scripture and the God of the Bible and think that he doesn't intervene in human reality and he doesn't do miraculous works and Jesus Christ is not Lord of all. There's no way that we can read Scripture and not come to that conclusion. We can't do it. We either come to that conclusion or we reject it altogether. There's no in-between. You can't say, well, I believe that Jesus was, you know, he, he existed, but he didn't really do all the things in the scriptures. He was just kind of a good dude that taught some good stuff. That's not Jesus according to God's word. So yes, there are essentials that you must believe in order to be a Christ follower. And one of them is, if he wants to, he can take five loaves of bread and feed 15,000 people. Which stretches our minds in all kinds of ways. For those of us on the leadership side, we need to think bigger. We need to think God can do what he wants to do and we need to be listening on our knees. And then from the hurt side, from the people who are in need this morning, you need to know that whatever you think is impossible can never happen. Your life will never change. It's the worst it can possibly be, and it's only going to get worse. You need to know this morning that Jesus can do what you think he can't. And I appreciate the order here because I'm Presbyterian in verse 40. This is what Jesus does. Have them sit down in groups. Hundreds and fifties, those numbers aren't significant, but only to see that like, hey, this is planned. There is order here. And like good Presbyterians, we're gonna do everything decently and in order. And then Jesus does what I can't explain. He takes the loaves and the fish and he multiplies them. And he divides them among these groups. And they all ate and were satisfied. Circle verse 42 if you're a highlighter or a pencil underliner in your Bible. This is always true of Jesus. He completely satisfies. And not only that, like one of my professors at CIU used to say, he gives us a little bit of cake too. A little bit extra, which in this case was a dozen basketfuls of broken fish and pieces of bread. All of them ate and were satisfied. You know, there was an old saying, uh, Christians aren't perfect, they're just one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Jesus is the bread of life. He is the source and sustainer of all things. And sometimes this is hard to understand because we're so physical and we're so sight and sound oriented. But wherever you have gone in your mind thinking about your need this morning, I want you to go there and think about what would it be like if that need were met? What would it be like in your life? How would you think that need might go away? Because because you weren't worried about it, you weren't afraid, you it was taken care of. 
And I want you to step out in faith and ask the Lord Jesus if some way, somehow, you believe he can, but you don't know how he can, he would take that and meet that need. And then I want you to share that need with somebody. I want you to share that need with somebody in this room that you trust so that you can start to see how God meets that need. But you have to believe that he can, just like you have to believe that he did this. The point is not that you believe that 15,000 people were fed. They were fed. It doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. The point is for you, in this generation, do you believe that you can see all of your needs, your most intimate and necessary needs met and fulfilled in Christ? That is the essential of the gospel. You trust Christ. Your greatest need is forgiveness of sin. But Paul writes to the Romans that God not only gives us his son Christ, but also with him freely gives us all things. Jesus has come to save you in your need. Believe that today. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the way that you use your word to change us and to challenge us and to grow our understanding of who you are. Lord Jesus, you said that you have come that we might have life. But not just life, life abundantly. Lord, if we're honest with ourselves, there are many ways where you have provided for us exceedingly beyond all that we can ask or think. And yet there is still great hurt and brokenness here in this very room among our family this church so I pray that you would expose need in the way that you only can so that those who are exposed wouldn't be angry or venomous their response would be Lord Jesus help me in my need help me in my lack help me in my unbelief Lord may we trust you as our great provider and sustainer as the one who can do anything necessary to meet us in our need we love you and we pray all these things in Christ's name Amen